Hello everybody, today I am driving the one thing guaranteed to outshine any supercar at any meet anywhere, a BMW Isetta bubble car. <laughs> I can actually confirm this theory is true because I met this car's owner Nick at a meet up here in Scotland three months ago. I told him I was hosting my own meet via Roadster a week later and that he should really bring this so I could see it. He did and the moment he parked it next to my F12 the Ferrari began to wear a cloak of invisibility because nobody cared about that, instead, rightly so, they all wanted to know about this. The history of the Isetta is actually particularly interesting. Today, they're best known as a BMW, but they were not the firm to first come up with it. It is in fact the brainchild of an Italian company called ESO. In fact, the name Isetta simply means the little ESO. And if you thought Lambo doors were cool, you ain't seen nothing yet. ESO made, amongst other things, fridges. So to get into this car, you actually need to operate a fridge door. Inside, you will find simply two seats with a relatively generous storage area behind them. The steering column and instrument move with the front door, and in the event of an accident, you're supposed to escape through the canvas roof at the top. That's provided, of course, that you have survived. Behind the seats, in the original ESO version, you would have found a very unusual 236cc four-stroke engine, good enough for about nine and a half horsepower. The 0 to 30 time was in the order of 30 seconds, and the 0 to 60 time was no, because the top speed was 47 mile an hour. It was never a roaring success, and ESO struggled to sell just about a thousand of them. BMW, though, saw the value in what they were creating, because they needed a car to sell to the post-war German economy, which required cheap, affordable transport. They bought not just the rights to the car, but also the tooling. However, when it landed back in Munich, they realised that not much about the original car was acceptable to them. So, they went about changing so much of it that not one single component is actually interchangeable with the original Italian built car. The engine grew ever so slightly by about 10cc and started to make an incredible 12 horsepower. The overall design is much the same and to the casual observer it doesn't look any different, but trust me it was. Luckily for BMW their efforts were rewarded because they also sold 160 times more of these than ESO did of theirs. Despite the BMW badging, this particular car wasn't actually built by them, it was instead constructed in Brighton, of all places. You see, having already bought the rights to the Isetta themselves, BMW realised there would be a demand for it in other markets they simply could not fulfil, so they in turn licensed it to various other countries, including Great Britain. It was constructed at a former site of the Locomotive Works of Brighton, in a hangar that formerly had been used for creating trains. The issue was there were only two ways to access that particular building. One was by rail, the other was by a flight of 100 steps. So these cars were sent out by rail on the same train that delivered supplies to the factory. This has essentially the same specification as a BMW built car with its later uprated 300cc engine, but there are some crucial differences. The most obvious is the fact this is right hand drive. This did cause some issues because the engine is largely on the right hand side of the car, so a counterweight had to be fitted in order to balance things out. Also, because of UK legislation, the majority of cars sold in Britain were not actually four wheelers, instead three-wheelers. This was for several reasons. First off, it got you around a large portion of the purchase tax that was in force at the time. Secondly, much like a Reliant, because the car was light enough, it could actually be driven on a motorcycle license rather than a car one, making it very popular with people who simply couldn't afford or didn't want to get a car license. At its peak, some 300 Isettas a week escaped from the British factory, which was moved and eventually shut down in 1964. This particular car, a four-wheeler, was sold in 1959 and purchased by its current owner Nick in 2020 as a lockdown project. He bought it knowing it required some work, but he didn't realise just how much. Nearly all of the body has been replaced, all of the mechanicals have been rebuilt, but luckily, because these cars were relatively popular and remain so to this day, spares are actually quite easy to come by. That being said, it has taken a lot of man hours to try and get this right. It was originally red, but not two-tone as you see it now. 
I have to say, this looks absolutely perfect and is how I would want one of these. He has also had the interior retrimmed with his tartan of choice, and that I'm told is a somewhat controversial choice, but is also much better than the material it had to begin with. He has done a number of journeys in the car, and his Zeta owners, I'm told, are quite bold, with some of them going as far as Spain and Italy. And that's from Scotland. Today, a good Isetta like this could set you back around £40,000, making it not cheap, but cheaper than something like a Peel P50, and it is actually a deal more usable than that. Although, let's be honest here, anybody buying one of these is not doing so for practical reasons. Even in the context of the Japanese K cars I have driven recently, this is relatively slow, rather small, and very unusual. But with luck, it should also deliver a driving experience unlike anything else I've ever had. Let's see. So then, how to drive a BMW Isetta bubble car? The controls are, in theory, all pretty familiar. You have clutch, brake, throttle, all where you'd expect them to be. They're all quite light and all fairly easy to use. The gear lever is to your right, where you may not expect it to be, but once you think about it, that's pretty much the only logical place for it to be. You have four gears in a more or less standard H pattern. Some of the other controls are a little quirkier, like the indicators, which is this little black and red dial over here. Now, I have genuinely only driven this car about sort of 20 yards by the time I started talking to you all. So, this is a learning experience for me as much as anyone else. Luckily, this is a hill. Oh, yep, yeah, that's definitely second. Let's try third, which is over there somewhere. That's third. Yep, got it. Got it. We've got traffic behind us. No. Oh, ho, ho, ho. this is quite an adventure. I apologize that the camera is quite close to me. That's because the camera is quite close to me. If you haven't worked it out by now, the car is tiny. Right. There's a junction down there. The car also seemed to want to die quite easily earlier. Not quite sure why we were driving it and it was fine. It only idles at about sort of 300 odd RPM anyway. So it always sounds like it's about to conk out. A little bit of throttle required to pull away. And we're off. <laughs> and sort of back and kind of towards me, I think for a second. Nope, that's not quite there. Yep, now we're in, now we're in. I'll tell you what. Let's go for third, which is up there. That's that. Really, please don't try and overtake. Oh, you did, didn't you? You had to. You couldn't resist. I'm now in fourth. Cruising speed in this car is about 40 odd mile an hour. Top speed, about 52. I have also been warned that uh, left-handers are considerably scarier than right-handers. The reason for that being, if you imagine for a moment, this is a very small car with a very short wheelbase and incredibly narrow track, particularly narrow at the back, and the engine is on the right, and so am I. I'm not light, neither is the engine. That means that when you are in a left-hander, there's a lot of weight pushing over there and not a lot trying to keep it in place. Fortunately, visibility all round is, as you might imagine, excellent because you are sat essentially in a tiny little goldfish bowl. It does sound absolutely delightful, this little thing. If it were a two-stroke, I think it would be fairly unpleasant to listen to, but it's not, and therefore, it's not. In truth, it is reasonably talky. This car's owner, Nick, also happens to have a Bentley, not entirely unlike the one that I drove last year, and he said the technique with this is very similar. You essentially don't bother with changing down a gear. You work from first, second, third to fourth, and then the idea is that you will come to a stop. The car can pull forth from fairly low down, because it's geared only for 50 odd mile an hour anyway, so it's not really that much of a concern. Rear visibility is not excellent. You do have a small little rear view mirror up here, but what it mostly shows you is the ground behind you. I did try and adjust it until I realised that where the bodywork is, it kind of obscures any cars behind you too. I do know that there is a car behind me, but happily, when you're driving
driving something like this, you realise people are probably quite content to follow you. Oh, I'm in a 30 limit now. Should I change down a gear? No. No, I'm not going to change down a gear. I'm going to come to a junction fairly soon and I will just stop. The brakes are actually quite decent. Remember, this is a 1950s bubble car. These are hardly Ferrari carbon ceramics, but they do bring it to a stop. The pedal feel is actually also pretty decent too. Yeah, you can't rush that gear change. There is no synchro. Pretty sure the indicators are also not self-cancelling. My favourite control in here is perhaps for the electric wipers, which is simply a little switch on the back of the motor, which is here in the cabin. As you might imagine, it's a rather sparse affair in here. There is no radio. I think there is a basic heater, but I could be wrong. There is a small little lever for a choke. You have a handbrake down here. That also works as you would expect it to. During the restoration process, great attention was paid to trying to keep the car looking as close to original as possible. Yes, the paint scheme is technically incorrect. It's a different shade of red than the car came in originally, and it wasn't two-tone but they have preserved the seams in the bodywork where all the different panels meet. They have preserved the spot welds. Many people, I'm told, are tempted to simply cover those over and make it look a little sleeker, a little more futuristic. Nick wanted to preserve as much of this car's character as he possibly could. And it is a car absolutely packed with character. It's an utter and total delight to drive this thing. No, don't change down, Dames. Just resist the urge, resist the urge. No, I'm gonna change down. I couldn't get it done in the Bentley. That, yes, got it! Only a small crunch, just a small one. Not gonna do it again, but it seemed necessary for this bit. He flung round this roundabout when we're doing the drive by was at quite some pace. I'm not going to do that. Lotus Elise, in green and yellow. There's a right hand, so I can lean in. A bit like a motorbike sidecar. Come on! Full power, that's 20, 25. Oh, yeah. Cooking on gas now, 30. Better change up. Yeah. The gearbox is actually nowhere near as reluctant as I feared it might be. It's actually quite friendly. The car is also surprisingly comfortable. The steering wheel is touching my belly because it's a large steering wheel and my belly isn't small. But the seat, I'm told, does have a little adjustment though, not enough to really make that much difference. And in all fairness, most old cars of this period at least had a steering wheel that was comically large anyway. Nowadays, of course, we view something like this as basically a novelty, but it's really easy to forget that when this came out, it was essentially an alternative to not another car, but to walking or a horse or a bicycle, or potentially motorcycle and sidecar. That, I think, is one reason why in the UK we sold many of the three-wheeled variant, because it was for the old boys that simply never got a car license and found themselves kind of trapped. Even as recently as 10, 15 years ago, when my dad and I were doing silly things with Reliant Robins, we bought a lot of them from old boys who simply never got a car license, and that's why they kept driving a Robin. I do distinctly remember the Robins having a reverse gear, which Nick said to me, in the early days at least, these weren't allowed to have if they were to qualify as a proper three-wheeler slash motorcycle. A lot of people tend to think it was the three-wheel bit that is why Reliance classified as a motorbike, but that's in fact only part of it. The other bit was the weight. A Reliant Rialto is a positively porky 440 kilos. This is about 330. Steering, as you might imagine, is a little on the vague side. Placing the car is actually a little trickier than you might imagine, and one of the biggest problems I've had with this is that because it's small and very quiet, people do tend to ignore it to a fault. Many don't seem to realise it's even coming, they don't hear it, they don't pay attention to it, or perhaps they just assume it's a lot further away than it really is. No one behind us, and you know something? I'm doing 35 mile an hour, and I'm very happy with that. I have the greatest of admiration for people that do serious miles in these. I'll have probably done about 10 of them, if that, in the course of this review, and for me, that's enough. If he said to me, hey, do you want to borrow the car for a few months, drive it all the way back down to England, 400 miles? No! No, I do not! If I was going to, it would be the sort of journey you plan to make sure you don't take in 
any motorways of any description for any length at all. That's just dangerous. And now I have a vehicle behind. Oh, <laughs> it does wash wide quite easily, this thing. Take the racing line through here. I've got visibility, don't panic about it. A little more cautious through here. And yep, we've got a car coming through, round. Through the tunnel and in. Oh, what a nice little section of road. In something like an Aston Martin V8 Vantage, I would be absolutely infuriated, particularly as a van is simply pulled out in front of me, didn't even see that I was there. However, in an Izetta, no, business as usual. You carry on, mate, you pull out, I really don't mind. As long as you don't pull into the side of me, that's not an issue. There is just one gauge in this car, a combined speed and mile counter. And since it's rebuild, this car has done around 750 of the things. That, by the way, is in a period of only about two or three months, which I think is very impressive. Though it may not have achieved the same success as the Mini or the 2CV, this, I think, is still a real cultural icon. You park anywhere in one of these and people will go absolutely bananas for it. It's a delightful little car with a heart of gold. In all, I'm told around 330,000 of these were sold across the globe. And today, in Germany and America, they still have a very strong following. Here in Britain, they are apparently reasonably hard to find. They were never really designed to last all that long. They were made out of cheap materials by people in an old railway shed in Brighton. Not exactly a byword for quality and durability. <laughs> it does feel like I'm about to feel, fall out that window. All right, shall we? Shall we go for? Se yeah, second. You know what? I've actually got the knack of the gearbox. The Bentley never happened. Drove it for ages. This, after about 15 minutes, nope. I've got the gearbox down to a T. I feel very confident in it now. Let's go for third. Got to run up with this hill. You see, now we're in the downhill section really got to put the pedal to the metal which is not very difficult come on old girl oh indicator's still on don't want that and in fact i need to indicate right to go back to our start location for today come on come on come on there we go oh perfect shift oh, i'm very pleased with myself i i will blow my own trumpet with that one very very happy and we go <laughs> it's a bit springy, it's a bit bouncy. That rear track, by the way, is very, very narrow because it uses essentially the same setup as a motorbike, but with an extra wheel. So it's a chain drive on the rear with no differential of any description. Very basic, and that's why it's only that wide when the car is that wide. Apparently this was the engineering compromise. In any case, I have had an absolutely delightful time in a BMW Isetta, and I hope you've enjoyed watching. If you want to see more weird, wacky and wonderful stuff like this on the channel and you own a car that fits this description or you think it's simply something you'd like to see me review, my email address is in the description of every single video. And now I'm going to go and drive something very, very different. That, a 1968 Dodge Charger RT with a 440 cubic inch engine. That's got more inches than this has centimetres. Looking forward to that one. As ever, a huge thank you to Nick for bringing his car out. Thanks to you for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and even if you have, make sure you've pressed the bell icon so you're notified of every single new video from me. See you for the next one. Bye-bye.